Mondays with Monsignor Pope here on Morning Joy, where truth matters. Welcome back to Morning Joy, where truth matters. I'm your host, Keith Downey, and uh, very excited to talk to Monsignor Charles Pope, continuing the conversation on discernment and vocations. Good morning, Monsignor. Well, good morning. How are you? <laughs> I, I'm, well, I'm doing well. Blessed. Very blessed. Thanks for asking. Well, yeah. Yeah, so the whole conversation this morning is about discernment and vocations. And, uh, I, you know, you can take it wherever you want to, but, uh, you know, it's curious to know your vocation and if there's anything you'd like to share upon that. You know, I, I heard um, Adam talking about, you know, the, the, a lot of people had this sense early in life they've been called or received a special call from God. And I have no doubt that, you know, uh, as, as uh, Jeremiah says, you know, before. I was formed in my mother's womb. God knew me and called me and so on. But at the end of the day, I didn't know it. <laughs> so until later, <clears throat> in fact, I, I don't I don't think I was a particularly spiritual child. I I have vague remembrances of making my first Holy Communion um, at the altar rail, 1968, or Our Lady Perpetual Help in Glenview, Illinois, hmm. right there north of Chicago. But um, I, I, I was a fidgety kid. I didn't like to go to church and... Um, all of that. Anyway, one day, I think, I think though, where God started to go to work was that I, it's, since I had to go to church, um, there was a, there was a new choir that was forming a high school choir there in the parish church where I was at the time at Holy Family in uh, Dale City, Virginia. And I noticed that there were a lot of pretty girls in the choir. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I joined the choir to meet girls. I mean, I wasn't particularly good at singing. I didn't, I never sung in a choir, uh, but I figured, well, let's, let's go for it. You know? And I did, I met a couple of them and dated, dated a couple of them, uh, two of them, you know, I had a high school sweetheart and, uh, and then in college also I dated one of the girls. Uh, I think I might've ended up marrying her. You know, I was all set to go, Keith. I, mm. I was, um, at that time, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, graduating um, uh, c college uh, by that time, and uh, I had a, I had a career with the Army Corps of Engineers at the beginning, and mm -hmm. I was pretty set to go. But the Lord intervened. So basically, what happened was I, I began to notice that um, when I in the choir, that yes, I I, I like the girls, <laughs> but I also began to like the music, and we sang more traditional music. Um, which was good for me. I didn't like a lot of that sort of folk music that was common. Um, and we sang some more traditional songs. I began to kind of listen to the words a little more, and I began to like the music. And, uh, and, and, and so little by little, I was drawn more deeply into the life of the church. Well, then almost by accident, just because I was the oldest one in the choir at the time, I was asked to temporarily direct it. Um, and... Um, then I had to start planning liturgies and all those things. And so little by little, I began to discover that I really, I felt like my heart was in the church. Mm. And I remember at the time I was dating, um, as I said, uh, uh, my, my college sweetheart. And I thought that uh, I, I, I began to have this weird feeling that God wanted me to be a priest. And I said, no, that can't be true. I mean, I'm all set to go. I mean, I'm ready for a uh, career and family. She wants to get married. And so I basically, I wasn't a very spiritual man. I mean, I was trying to be, but at the, at the end of the day, I said, well, in a, in a very spiritual moment, I said, Lord, if you really want this, I need a sign, you know, I mean, I'm not going to break this girl's heart. <clears throat> and um, just in some wild idea, just out of nowhere that I'm supposed to be a priest. So anyway, um, I don't know what it was. I can't even remember what it was. We had some disagreement and she broke up with me and she was clear. She didn't want to, she was done. Wow. I mean, and, uh, it's certainly easy so for I said, you, All sure. right, Lord. <laughs> there was my sign, you know? Yeah. So I stopped dating, and I, I you know, I, I was finishing up college, as I said, and already working for the Corps of Engineers, but I, I um, called the diocese, got started, and, and you know, I, I went to seminary, and I will tell you, Keith, it wasn't easy in the seminary, but the first year, after the first year, I think they were going to ask me to leave. I, I won, I, I, hmm. I was saved by only one vote. Wow. You know, they thought I was too, you know, I don't know, rigid, uptight. They didn't, they, I don't know. They didn't like me. And, uh, um, and so I, I remember one priest wagging his bony finger at me. You'll be a rotten priest. <laughs> that kind of a thing. And I, I'm like, okay. Uh, you know. okay. And frankly, in that time in the seminary, there was a lot of problems in, in seminary education in the eighties. You know, I mean, it was, 
very, very um, progressive. And if you didn't, you know, mm. stand up and applaud for calls for women's ordination and all this stuff, you were rigid, you were bad, you were terrible, that kind of stuff, you know. Mm. But anyway, at the end of the day, um, I, 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 I did. I, I came back. I, in fact, I kept my job at the Corps of Engineers over the summer. I said, <laughs> I'm going to go back and fine tune some of my projects because I didn't. It didn't look so good. So. But after the first year, things settled in, and I was um, more good to go, so to speak. And that's, in a nutshell, it was a little rocky. It was a little, for me, I wasn't like, there I was at the altar rail, and I just felt the call. You know, it wasn't anything beautiful or romantic like that. I just sort of became aware of it. Interesting. Now, you mentioned you you had your first communion in, like, the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, was, was there... You know, as far as your formation as a priest, because obviously there was, you know, the changing of kind of how the the ordinary form came to be. Was oh, the, yeah. what was that like? Uh, you know, going to seminary with with that being said. You know, I, I don't. I, I was a little kid at the time, and my only rec, my only remembrances about the changes in the mass were that, um, like in 1968, we were still kneeling at the altar rail. I remember that. Um, I think so. I, I know that our particular parish was a little slower to change because we had a very old pastor, Father Dustman, and mm -hmm. he had Parkinson's. And so we, we, we didn't, you know, we weren't on top of all the changes, you know, like that. So maybe that's part of it. I remember one moment, though, where I did feel some alarm. Uh, when we moved to another parish, we moved to Florida and at, at the Navy base, they removed the altar rail at some point. It's been a mountain. This would have been around 1969 or so, and I spent close to 1970. Okay. And um, I remember being alarmed by that, not because of theological reasons, but my mother had a marble coffee table kind of thing there in the house, and we were told to stay away from that because marble is very expensive. And it's a very, you know, and I thought of marble as something, you know, important and impressive, and to see them rip a rail out, and it was all piled up behind the, in, in heaps behind the, like, I mean, it's something I was old. What I was, I was about nine, 10 or 11 years old. I, it struck me as like, that's weird. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, I, those are my only remembrances of the change of the liturgy. Uh, I just wasn't all that tuned in, but I will say this, you know, it's funny how God works. I, I joined the choir, you know, to meet my bride and, um, uh, I, God did show me my bride, you know, the church, right. you know, I mean, God is, God has a sense of humor, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I, I love being a priest. I, I think um, we, um, I, I've never had any serious crisis, you know, of, of vocation. Mm -hmm. I've had some rough moments of more personal matter, like, you know, where I might've been suffering. At one point I had to be treated for kind of panic disorder. I was just, I wasn't managing stress. And mm -hmm. I mean, I was literally on cardizem and all kinds of heart medicine because I was stressing myself out. So I had to go through moments like that, but I never, never doubted after I was ordained, I never looked back. I never doubted I was still to be a priest. And mm -hmm. I thank God for that. And uh, I think of all the three things, you know, poverty and chastity and obedience, which we secular priests don't vow, but we do promise, uh, particularly mm -hmm. obedience and, and celibacy, chastity. You know, I think I, I haven't had too much trouble with any of that. I, I've gotten the hardest one is obedience. It isn't yeah. celibacy. Oh, it's got to be celibacy. It's so hard. Actually, it's not that hard. I, I, I mean, and I, I, by the way, I want to say this not for my sake, but I think for a lot of brother priests, you know, I, I have since I was ordained. A deacon and so on. I have never been out of line with anybody in a sexual matter at all. Not even once. You know, part of it's just that I'm shy. But, but I, I mean, there's a gift there, and I do. Most of the priests I know are like that. There's these odd ones out that, you know, that end up in kind of weird situations. Mm -hmm. But, but I think I, I love being a priest, and I can't imagine not being celibate in the sense that I'm so busy. How could I possibly be a husband and a father? That's just a crazy thing. Anybody who talks like that either doesn't know what it means to be a husband and a father or doesn't know what it means to be a priest. Mm -hmm. But to think you could do both well, I just can't imagine. I'd have to completely rethink my priesthood if I was married with children. I mean, it would be my main, what would be my main vocation? Well, I think it would have to be that I was a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I cannot come to the synodality meeting to give you a talk on Saturday. <laughs> my kid has a soccer game. I mean, it comes down to just stuff like that, you know, I can't imagine. So I, as I say, I, I don't, 
I, I love being a priest and I, uh, I, I do, I, I've, I've embraced celibacy as a very great gift and I, I don't look back. And uh, by the way, the girls, both girls I dated, both of them are married. Both of them are grandmothers now. I mean, we're, we're all, you know, we all did fine. So yeah. there weren't any broken hearts along the way. You know I mean? We, we all got over it, whatever it was. So God is good. Yeah. Yeah. He's good. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I know there's a lot of young men and probably older men as well that are probably going through the same situation that you went through where they have no idea what their vocation is and they're going through some of this back and forth turmoil what could you recommend them well as i say i i think you have to have a gentle trust in god i i i have found that you know um usually god doesn't call people especially to vocational things like marriage or priesthood or religious life by, by wrenching them and, and, and tearing them apart. Um, God offers, he, 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 our desires are very important in this. We should listen to our heart and listen to our desires. Um, and God will be, I think, gentle in these matters. There are times when we're in serious sin or something that God might wrench us. But when it comes to vocations, I think God gently works through our desires. And I often, when people are wondering about whether they're called to the priesthood, if I see a lot of turmoil about that or whatever, I say, I don't, I don't think so, hmm. you know? Uh, but if I see a gentle openness and a kind of a joy that, um, uh, this would be something I, I think that, that, that would be something that I'd, I'd like to do. And I think that uh, God is calling me to, that's when I'm, I'm more convinced um, I remember when somebody came to me once and they said, I'm being called to be a priest because it's the hardest way. I said, well, maybe it is. I think it's harder to be married, but <laughs> what do I know? But, but the point is that I said, that's not why you want to be a priest. That's not, no, it, it, it's not. It, the, the question is, is this the way that God wants you? Anyway, that man is now happily married and he has about seven kids that that's, you know, you know, I mean, he went the right path. It wasn't for him to be a priest. You know, but he's he's now a good a, a good a happily married man. Yeah. Well, perfect. Well, before we head on out, uh, Monsignor, would you be able to give us a uh, a prayer before we uh, head out? Yes, and, and may Almighty God please uh, uh, make Your will known to many young men and women. May they all indeed uh, be blessed in their discernment, and may Almighty God bless all the listeners, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Monsignor Charles Pope, for always hanging by us. We can also catch you, by the way, on Live Live Joyfully every weekday at 4 p.m. on the Guadalupe Radio Network. So thank you so much again for joining us. And yes, it is the end of our first hour. Obviously, we want to thank all of those who have been listening, especially those on Aquinas Communications and those arriving at their destination, or maybe they're going to Holy Mass. Either way, we've got a second hour coming up. And we're talking with Sister Orion Pietra Rene on the next hour, talking more about vocations and so much more. Make sure to follow us on YouTube. And hey, we'll see you right after this break. This has been Morning Joy, where truth matters. Hosted by Keith Downey. Take some joy with you today. Visit grnonline.com slash joy to listen again. Share a segment or answer the question of the day. That's grnonline.com slash joy.